And now, the conclusion of my interview with Congressman Charlie Malasa. You know, uh, to go back to that earlier topic about uh, basically who sets the agenda, um, it's also interesting to note, and uh, it's it's actually received some media attention. Uh, the Republicans have set a very short calendar for you guys this year as well. The the shortest working session in the history of the Congress, next to the 1948 Congress, which Harry Truman called the Do Nothing Congress, right. and I believe that this one the Do Less Than Do Nothing Congress. 92 days out of a whole year. Which is unbelievable to me. We're, we're supposedly at war, right? <laughs> and I just, I, I, I can't, I can't understand. We've been inundated with storms. We've got catastrophic uh, 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 droughts and flooding throughout the country that have damaged property, damaged crops. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and there's no money to help them. Right. And we're not legislating trying to help them. I mean, I tried after the storm. Uh, to get amendments put on these disaster bills to help the sugar farmers, the rice farmers, the cattle farmers, the citrus and fruit growers, um, you know, the people that were affected by the storm. Now, just in the sugar industry alone, they suffered 200, and estimated by LSU, $268 million. Finally successful to squeeze $40 million out. $40 million ain't going to help those people no. stay in business. And most of those folks along the test that were in sugar business they were just getting to the point where they had hoped that this past season, since Lily and Isidore damaged them so badly, they were just looking to get back on their feet, pay some of those bills that they had, because their crop rotation was finally at a point where they had they had optimism that it was going to be good. Right. And he went to hell in a handbasket. You know what happened from right. there. Uh, Forty million is not going to keep this industry alive and well cattle farmer over in, in Vermillion Parish, 1,500 head of cattle. Uh, the federal government rules are going to allow the federal government to reimburse them up to a maximum of $80,000. 1,500 head of cattle is over a million dollars. It's probably closer to a million and a half dollars worth of cattle. They're gone. You can't insure them, no. okay, but they're gone. Yeah. And, you know, some people are going to say, well, you know, why are we doing that? Because you're trying to keep an economy alive, you're trying to keep a segment of the economy yeah. alive, and you're trying to help people that were devastated by a storm. Whether it's an earthquake, whether it's a flood, whether it's a volcano, whatever the, right. the disaster is, our government has always been there to try and help make things better, quicker. Absolutely. And we're not doing that right. Well, on last week's show, we sat down with Michael McHale, who is the chairman of the Calcasieu Parish Democrats. And, you know, he illustrated this probably better than anyone that I've talked to. And mainly because, you know, I, I only moved here in 1999, so I'm still trying to learn Louisiana. And there's a lot to learn. Every time I think I've learned something, I realize you learn that how I'm to just, make a rule yet? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I buy it in a jar. <laughs> but at least I know to buy it. <laughs> there you go. And you know how to use it. Um, that's, that's right. I know how to use it. Um, the question is, you know, he brought up the point that, you know what, when the country has asked anything of Louisiana, we've been there. Yeah. You know, if you look at a map of all the pipelines, uh, you're going to see Louisiana is really at the heart of where they're all coming in. Yes. If you look at where all of the grain that's produced up in the Midwest, it comes all through our ports. Yeah. You know, when you look at that, you know, Louisiana has paid its fair dues. You know, we contribute incredibly well to this country. But then you compare and contrast that with Katrina and Rita and the response since. And, you know, a lot of people in this area really feel like the federal government has completely and totally forgotten about them. Yeah, that, you know, and, and I agree. There are some people out there that don't think the federal government has a part to play in this. I'm not one of those people. Uh, I believe that there is a place for government to help revitalize the community, whether it's economic development grants or loans, SBA loans, but they're doing an awful job at getting, helping those people get back. And then, of course, we've got an insurance problem in, along the coastal uh, coast of Louisiana. I understand it's a problem throughout the United States along the coastal areas. The insurance companies used to be companies that wrote insurance and paid when you have a loss. They're now money launderers. Yeah. They're money brokers. They don't write insurance anymore. They pretend to write insurance. When they're not giving you the coverages that you need, then they're not an insurance company anymore. Let's quit faking it. Uh, you know, so 
Uh, I, as a member of Congress, uh, there's a lady named Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who's from Florida, yeah. uh, a friend of mine that's in the Congress. She and I and some other people have put together a bill to set up a commission immediately, as soon as a, the Republican majority will let us get it to the floor, to set up this commission to recommend or direct the federal government how we handle catastrophic events, how we handle disasters that are not covered by insurance policies that you can't buy. Right. Because if the insurance companies aren't going to write them, somebody's got to yeah. do it. Otherwise, the economy in these areas that are affected will go to, I mean, it's exactly. going to die. You know, the communities of Homa and Thibodeau and Lafayette and you know, Iberia, and, uh, right. you can go across the coast. They will shrivel up and go away if yeah. you can't buy insurance for your homes, if you can't buy insurance for your businesses, uh, if, you, if you can't protect them uh, you know, with levees and the coastal restoration of the marshes. Okay. You've got nothing. Everything that we know about South Louisiana, uh, that I've enjoyed about South Louisiana all my life, hunting and fishing right. um, in the coastal marshes, if we don't do something soon, that'll be gone, and the people that work and live here will right. have to move also. That's true. Um, so tell me, where do things stand right now with uh, offshore royalties? Um, I know that there's uh, basically, uh, we had talked on our program before, that there are basically two separate bills uh, that are going on, one that passed in the Senate, one that uh, has passed, I believe, in the House, and we're trying to work out the two. We're trying to work out the differences. We're at the point where we're, you know, we're conferencing. We're supposed to be conferencing. Right. A conference committee, I have been told by my, my leadership, that I will be on the conference committee if and when they um, see the conference committee. Now, the House members, uh, there's about six of us, with the chairman, uh, Pombo, and that have been meeting regularly to, to talk about what we're willing to offer to the Senate as a compromise. Our problem is, is that the Senate doesn't want to come forward with any, take any of our compromise. Right. They want their bill the way it was with no compromise, and that's not the legislative system. Right. And what they're offering for it to the House doesn't really do Louisiana much good. The amount of money that comes out of it will be minimal. Uh, it won't give us the financial wherewithal to save these marshes, to rebuild these levees, uh, to protect our communities and protect ourselves from future hurricanes. It just isn't enough. The House bill on the other side is very generous. It does a far lot more, but we have made concessions to the Senate saying, just meet us a little bit. Right. We've agreed to the 37.5% cost share. All the inland states that have federal lands that they extract minerals from get 50%. But well, we will to take 37.5%, but we've got to have some meaningful revenue coming out of that 37.5%. Right. And the Senate bill doesn't do that for us. So the, other, the, the other part of the problem is, is that you've got all the East Coast states, Florida all the way to, to Canada, and you've got all the West Coast states, California, Oregon, and, and Washington, that don't want drilling off their coast, but they want cheap gas made. They want cheaper natural gas for heating their homes and running their businesses. But they don't want to participate. We've been participating in oil and gas production in this country for 50 years. Right. We've been doing our share and getting zero for it. Right. Give us some of our money. We can get out of your hair to the large extent. We don't have to keep begging and groveling for help to come back down here and, and rebuild ourselves. We can do some of those things for ourselves. But we've got a Congress, any element of the Congress that says, you don't deserve any of that money, right. which I don't understand. Right. Right. Well, and I find that interesting. You know, I mean, I, I've heard the arguments from the other side basically stating that, you know, what what the the House bill does is it forces – these East Coast states and West Coast states to open up their shores. That's not what this bill does. This no. says that if they do choose to open up, then this will happen, correct? Yeah. For the last 25 years, there's been a, a moratorium on drilling. Mm -hmm. Other than our four states, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Texas, and Alaska, that has done some drilling. Alaska wants to drill. But all those other states had moratoriums, presidential moratoriums that and Clinton, Bush, uh, but that nobody wants to lift right. and say, okay, start drilling. So now what happens is in the in the House version, we said, let's give them an opt-in, opt-out. The state legislature and their governor 
at any time they want can opt in or opt out. Now, with the straight moratoria, there's no option. So he said, okay, any state that wants to do it, let's put the language, allow them to opt in, opt out. The, the Senate version doesn't allow that, and they don't want that language in there, which doesn't make sense. Right. You know, somebody says, well, Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware can't agree on, you know, how far the, the, the line, where the lines draw. Right. How f Look, that's not my problem. Go work it out. You want energy independence in this country? Right. You want gasoline less than $3 a gallon? If you want natural gas that's less than $12, $12 a million cubic feet, if you want to be able to do something with your money other than buy fuel to go to work and eat your home and, and, and not have any pleasures in life, then don't drill. Right. But, you know, these, these, these members, and some of them I know, and I said, I just don't understand you. Right. You know, the Floridians talk about their white sandy beaches. I said, for God's sake, we had the two worst hurricanes in the history of this country, and there weren't any oil spills. Right. Okay? There's a way to do it safely. There's a way to yeah. do it. But, you know, they, 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 all, all those states, they want in energy independence. They want cheaper energy, uh, but they're not willing to participate. We're willing. Right. Just give us a share of it. Absolutely. You're in a, you're in a race right now. Uh, it's almost election time again. Uh, November 7th, everyone. You got to make sure you turn out and vote. Um, uh, tell me, what, what are you, what are your, uh, plans for the future? What are you looking to accomplish, uh, in the next term that maybe you weren't able to get accomplished this term? Well, hopefully in the next term, we'll be able to start addressing the deficit. Uh, talk about PAYGO. Uh, talk about a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. Talk about health care. Uh, continue to to act on uh, providing the, the wherewithal for the coastal areas, the Gulf Coastal areas, to rebuild and get back on their feet. Uh, there's a lot of business that we need to take care of in this business, in this this country. We need to look at, at an insurance issue and make sure that's it. Insurance for health and insurance for property, yeah. uh, both of them. You know, we've got a lot of things that we should have been doing these last two years that were not addressed. Uh, for whatever the reason, right. we addressed some silly stuff, right. but we didn't address the real solid issues that we should have been addressing. My hope is that we will have an offset in the federal government. By that, I mean a balance between the parties, so one party isn't running this country, uh, that there will be oversight. Now, when you go back to the, the, the Clinton administration with the Republican House and Senate, there was over a hundred subpoenas issued. There were yep. there were oversight hearings almost every day going on in some committee. In this Congress, in the last six years, no subpoenas, no oversight hearings, no audits, or the or the or the the normal day. Right. And that's not what we should be doing. Well, and I was surprised too, frankly. I mean, one of the things that just blew me out of the water was uh, presidential veto. Only happened one time so far, and look what it was for. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, to me, I was just shocked that, I mean, that's usually a tool that's used by presidents. That's and right. you don't really have to when you're all talking the same talk and drinking the same Kool-Aid. Right. If, we, if we pull the majority, if nothing else, if we balance out the parties so that there's some checks and balances, and if the, if the number between the majority and the minority come into a closer number rather than 20 votes yeah. where they can slam dunk, if that happens, where it's a closer majority minority number, then people may start talking to each exactly. other. Exactly. A phenomenon that is not happening right, right now in the Congress of the United States. And I believe the Blue Dogs have a, an important role to play if that occurs. Uh, and actually, I believe that the moderate, what they call, they call themselves moderate Republicans, right. but they're centrists, just like the Blue Absolutely. Dogs are centrists. If we can build a coalition with those people that think like, <laughs> I do. Those right. Republicans that think like the Blue Dog Democrats, we can probably put 50 or 60 people together and make them come to the table, regardless of what party, and talk about compromise from whatever the left wants or whatever the right wants, bring it to the center and make it work for America. Exactly. Don't make it work for the Republicans and Democrats. Make it work for America. And right now, I mean, you, you said it really well earlier. I mean, there, there seems to be one group or one class of people that are really benefiting. And, you know, I know many people that I talk to today, I mean, they really do feel like there's a war right now and it's against the middle class. You know, it's harder and harder for mom and dad to be able to put, you know, food on the table. There's, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal this, this week 
Uh, and basically, today's Tuesday, so it was yesterday, obviously, either yesterday or Friday, I don't remember. But it was about the disappearing middle class. Yeah. You know, and somebody asked me the other day, what's the middle class? You know, it's difficult to define. Yeah. You know, based upon income, where the middle class used to be, maybe that used to be forty or fifty thousand right. dollars a year. Is it at two hundred thousand dollars a year now? I don't know where it is. All I know is that people that used to make what they thought was a good living are struggling to pay for the gasoline, for the health care costs, for the food on the table, for the children's education and all those other things that they need to provide, and then have some left over for retirement or for a leisure weekend or a vacation once a year. And that's what concerns me is that people are working all the time and are not having the monies that they need or the, the ability to save the money that gets them through those tough times. I mean, rule of thumb when I was growing up, you have at least three months' worth of, of, of uh, savings account in case something happens to you. Right. Uh, to at least carry for three months. Uh, you know, I know some kids these days, and they're good, hardworking young people. Yeah. They don't have diddly yeah. saved. They've got notes on the house, notes on the car, notes on the credit boat, cards. Credit cards. Yeah. And if one of them loses a job, if, for instance, in my district, if the Mississippi uh, River Industrial Complex shuts down because of the price of natural gas, I'm fearful of what I'll see along that river. In the 80s, we saw what happened when this Gulf Coast, working Gulf Coast, oil and gas industry hit a recession. Right. And everything, that I think the, the billboard said, last one out, uh, turn our lights out. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, it went to hell in the handbasket real quick. Quick. And, and people were struggling in this region. I'm fearful of that happening with a stumbling economy that in the last three, three months has performed negatively, has not had all the indicators chunk, uh, uh, hitting on all eight cylinders. As, and, and if that continues and we start losing some of that performance, it isn't going to be far to get to the horizon where the problems really are. Right. So hopefully we can go back here into this Congress, um, address some of the issues we should have addressed here in November when we go back, or, if not, take a full agenda and start working on it the 1st of January when we start the new 110th Congress. That's right. Absolutely. Um, any parting thoughts to uh, the folks of Acadiana and uh, down in your neck of the woods? Now we're broadcasting down into New Iberia, uh, into Vermilion Parish and everything. Any parting thoughts? Well, I, the, the only thing I can say to folks is, I, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to, to serve as your congressman. Uh, everybody didn't vote for me. I know that, uh, but I've worked hard to, to earn, earn their votes. Um, you know, hopefully those people that didn't vote for me will see that I've worked hard and will give me the opportunity to go back and serve. Um, yeah, I've got a lot that I want to do. If for no other reason, because I now have a new grandson that has really woke, opened my eyes to understand that the legacy I leave, he can either thank me for it or hate me for it. And I don't want the latter. Good for you. Well, folks, uh, this has been uh, yet another Blue Mondays. Uh, we thank the congressman for taking some time out of his incredibly busy schedule uh, to meet with us. Uh, folks, I know that there's probably going to be a lot of individuals here in Lafayette that probably have congressman envy right now. Uh, but uh, there is a lot that you can do to help Congressman Wausau. You can log on to his website, uh, which we have displayed right now on the screen. Click through, check out his website, and see what you can do to help him in his bid for yet another term serving uh, the people of of Louisiana. Uh, again, we greatly appreciate your time and your effort, and uh, we look forward to helping you any way we can. Uh, folks, uh, go ahead and stay tuned, and we'll be back in just a few seconds. Tick, 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 tick. Our future tick, tick, is up tick, tick, to you. Tick. Go to fightglobalwarming.com while there's still time. 
And that was our interview with Congressman Charlie Malasong. Congressman, we greatly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and spend an entire hour with us and talking about the issues that are most important to you and to the constituents of your district and really the entire state. We greatly appreciate it. You're doing a great job representing us in Washington, D.C. We need more people like you. And I have to tell you, as I said in the interview, uh, there are a lot of individuals out there after seeing this interview that now have Congressman Envy. Uh, we hope that you are not a stranger to this area of the state, and we hope that you uh, do a great job, and we know you will, during your reelection campaign. For individuals out there who would like to reach out to the congressman's office and help him in his re-election bid, you should definitely log on to the congressman's re-election website. That site is listed right below, uh, so you can see it right there. Uh, you'll be able to log on to his website, sign up for his newsletter, and also volunteer in the different areas that you may be good at. He could use folks' help in many different areas. Even if you're outside of the area, feel free to uh, f uh, sign up to support the congressman because there's many things that you can do now over the internet uh, to support the congressman in his re-election bid. It already seems like uh, his competitor is already starting to go a little bit negative. Uh, it's too bad for that. Congressman Malasson has done an incredible job representing us here in Louisiana and in oftentimes, many times, he was the sole voice fighting back and trying to fight for the individual rights that we have here in Louisiana that our federal government let us down on during our two hurricanes last year. Thank you, Congressman. We greatly appreciate all of your help. And that is yet another episode of Blue Mondays. Blue Mondays, again, is where we take a look at national, state, and local news through a progressive perspective. Every single week, we'll be able to take a look behind and kind of unspin some of the news items that have been spun up uh, to a fervor on regular broadcast news. We hope that you'll tune in each and every week. In between watching the show, log on to our website. You'll be able to catch up on local, state, and national news uh, that is linked through our website. And don't forget to click over to the blog. There's a lot of information. We're getting a lot of traffic over on the blog, specifically about Foley Gate and the Republicans' attempt to try and cover up their misdeeds. Uh, it's definitely a, an ongoing saga that is a, truly a tragedy. Uh, but do check it out. There's a lot of great information on there. And of course, on our website, you'll be able to see this and every other episode that we have of Blue Mondays in case you missed one. Uh, that uh, being said, uh, tomorrow morning, brew your cup of coffee. Get up about five minutes early and curl up to your laptop or your computer at home and log on over to theadvertiser.com. Each and every Tuesday morning, you'll be able to check the left blog written by yours truly, Stephen Handwork, and where we take a look at different issues that are taking place in our area. This week, I take a look at the local area and why Mike Stagg is right for the Louisiana 7th Congressional District and why he should be our next congressman. Congressman Bustani has a lot of explaining to do, and I hope you take a look at my column and let me know what your thoughts are. But that's it. That's all the time we have. So thanks a lot for joining us here on Blue Mondays. We hope to see you back next week at 9 o'clock Monday night on AOC Channel 15. Good night, and take care of each other.